Whoa. Check out this guy. Dude, he looks amazing. I can't wait to see him in the anime. Whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait. There he is. There he is. Oh my god, yes, finally. Dude, he looks amazing. Oh. Woo. Yeah, let's go. Wait, what? That's it? You gotta be sh Screen time is a very important aspect of a character development. It determines the how we make on the character, guiding our journey through their story and shaping our feelings toward them. Whether we grow to admire them or despise them, when we talk about anime, it's clear that a significant portion of it, let's say around 70%, will turn into product merchandise. Because of this impact of the screen time, it becomes apparent why we end up buying their figures or plushies of a certain characters. It's not an addiction, it's our love for the character, says every Gojo fangirl ever. Anime cleverly intertwines character screen time with our emotional investment, leading us to express our fandom through various forms of merchandise. Now let's talk about franchises that are merchandise-driven shows. When everything you see on screen can be found on your local toy store, it becomes a strategic effort back in the day to entice you to beg your parents to buy you those items. This especially true for popular series where every Beyblade, Yu-Gi-Oh! and Bakugan is meticulously designed to captivate your interests and make you want to own a piece of that world. From action figures to plushies, these franchises thrive on turning our screen time fascination into tangible products that fill store shelves and our wish lists. For Gundam, merchandising essentially saved the franchise from cancellation thanks to the company that believed in its potential. Almost every mobile suit in that series has its own model kit to some degree. Back in the day, it features a single Gundam and an interesting supporting characters that feel multi-dimensional due to the effective storytelling. And I realized that some of the mobile suit in the series didn't really get a lot of screen time. Take Ramba Ra, for example. He's a brilliant tactician in the Master of Guerrilla Warfare from the Xeon Army, known for his famous catchphrase, This is no Zaku, boy, no Zaku. This character was so influential that the Gundam Sea Destiny paid homage to him by repeating his iconic line. Yet he didn't really last that long in the original series, not even making it to the first half after Amuro wrecked his goof. Unless you've watched Gundam The Origin where he is a supporting role in that uh, show. You might not realize his limited screen time in the 1979 series despite this Ramburo became an icon in the Gundam universe, even appeared in the Gundam Build Fires, I'll bet with less Riz. It's the layers given to his character, like encouraging Amuro to beat him, that resonate with fans and he managed to capture people's hearts even with limited screen time. This phenomenon isn't unique to Rao. If you're a longtime Gundam fan, you've likely seen many iconic mobile suits that left a lasting impression despite their brief appearances on screen. The way these characters and suits are presented ensures they remain memorable. Gundams like Tryon 3, which only appeared in average of like 2 or 3 episodes, it served as a satire of a super robot genre. Despite this brief appearance, its unique take and memorable presence were things we didn't know we needed. Now, it has become one of the few Gundams to earn a spot of the Soul of Chugokin line, featuring a full-on combining robot. Aliel Saj's Arch Gundam just wakes up one day and chooses violence, giving the celestial beings more headaches than they could have handled. And who can forget the goof costume in 8th MS team? It solos the ground Gundams, goes on a killing spree against the gun tanks, and still manages to win the fight despite being taken down by Shiro Amada. 
The fight scene is incredible, and I highly recommend watching it if you haven't already. You know, it's kind of amazing us viewers. We are often driven by the rush of dopamine that comes from seeing these exciting characters and moments on screen, and this leads us to want to buy their toys immediately. So you start pre-ordering, and then regrets it later when the dopamine disappears and reflect on your life choices. Consumerism 101, everybody, let's go. Now, as we talk about memorable Gundam, let's not talk about Gundam, who didn't really do that much to us, and just there to be added in the lineup for some extra cash. So look, to be fair, it's important for us to understand that the era of pre-internet Gundam series is long gone. Shows like Gundam Wing, Gundam Seed, and Gundam Double O to mention a few, these were the series where we didn't know which mobile suit would appear, we had to wait for the anime to air on TV to see their debut. Yes, the internet already exists in this time. But it's not as relevant compared to today. When these shows aired in Cartoon Network back in the day, there were toys were already in your local toy section. Gone of the days where Carl Urban and Vigo Mortensen buying Gundam and Kamen Rider casually in Tokyo. Oi Huey, got you some bloody Gundams. Womp womp. <laughs> oh god, what is wrong with me? Nowadays, when a new Gundam series is announced, we pretty much know which Gundams will appear in the series. Bandai utilizes all social media platforms to reveal their next Gunpla lineup, programming us to expect a lot from these new mobile suits even before knowing how well they play in the show. This trend became particularly noticeable with the series Gundam Iron-Blooded Orphans. The series was a big deal back in the day, especially since the franchise had been dominated by Gundam Build Fighter series after Gundam Reconquista NG failed to capture the audience's interest. Even the creator Yoshiki Tomino famously said, Yeah, this show is kinda shit, which discouraged people from watching it. Interestingly, some viewers later claimed that this series was actually quite good, leaving me confused about whether Tomino was trolling. My opinion is still pending as I am currently watching Gundam Reconquista NG. When Iron-Blooded Orphan was airing, the series carried the weight of bringing Gundam back into the mainstream spotlight. We were constantly glued to the internet eagerly awaiting for new Gunpla releases and the latest episode of the anime. And I have to say, they were quite successful of it. Until the second season arrived. It didn't quite live up to the first in my opinion, while the second season wasn't bad, it lacked the straightforward, impactful premise of the first season, which was very simple. Focus on survival, rescuing the princess, ensuring her safety, and freeing the children. The second season still had some of my favorite moments in Gundam series, but it felt like they were trying to do much introducing new characters that we barely cared about and adding shocking moments that sometimes felt like they were just there for the sake of shock value. It seemed like they were trying to pack in more than they could handle, but despite these issues, I still recommend watching it as I believe the series ultimately delivers a powerful message by the end. But when I tried re-watching the series, I noticed something interesting about the first Gumpla release, Barbados in its basic form. It actually wasn't featured very long in the series. To be precise, this wasn't even Barbados original form. It didn't fully debut until the battle with Kyushan. When Barbados arrives on Earth, it almost immediately upgraded to the sixth form. These got me thinking because of the way Gundam and IBO are designed with the Gundam frames allowing for different weapons 
and armor configuration, it opens up opportunities for multiple Gunpla releases, and of course, it's no surprise that many of these variations end up in premium Bandai. Take my boy Galio for example. He's one of my favorite characters in the series. This guy doesn't just pilot one, not two, not three, but four different Gundams throughout the series. I know it's pretty common for characters to have more than one mobile suit, but with Galio, it felt different. Every time he appeared on screen, it seemed like he was piling new Gundam, to the point where I almost forgot what the original Kimaris looked like. Vidar is my favorite in terms of design, but it barely had any screen time before getting upgraded again. If I had to choose a favorite mobile suit from the anime, it would be Kimaris Trooper. Despite its limited screen time, the moment it had were powerful, filled with sense of sadness and loss. I honestly wish Galio was the main villain in Season 2. I love the design of the Kumar Trooper and probably my second favorite overall. Unfortunately, this kit is hard to find nowadays, so I'm really hoping we can get a reprint on this guy soon. So yeah. This has been bothering me lately. I mean, I get it. The answer is always money. I'm a guy in his late 20s talking about model kit robots. So of course, I understand that money should be the top priority. But what's really frustrating is that the number of episodes in the new anime series keeps getting lower and lower. It's like they're trying to keep up with people's ever-shortening attention spans. Look, I'm always going to defend Witch from Mercury. It has the best animation in Gundam series to date, and the character development especially for the supporting cast was top notch. But rewatching the last episode still feels a bit rushed, no matter how I look at it. It's like there were a hurry to wrap things up. I get it, maintaining that level of quality in animation is incredibly challenging, let alone an original anime but it feels like they pulled the plug too quickly. Come on guys, you don't need at least 50 episodes to tell a good story. Even though I really like Witch from Mercury, it still has the issues I mentioned earlier. I mean, Solweta Mercury goes through 3 Gundam in just 24 episodes. Technically 2, but you get my point. Hmm... To be honest, maybe I'm the problem, maybe this video isn't really about screen time, maybe I just miss the days when we spent so much time with the Gundam that when it was destroyed it meant something, whether it made you feel sad or left you off for the sheer mecha carnage. Don't get me wrong, having a wide range of Gumpla options every year isn't a bad thing at all. It gives modelers creative freedom to customize and power up their builds. There's nothing wrong with that. After all, it's always exciting to see Gumpla releases each year. It's like Christmas, but for Gumpla builders. But for me, the issue arises when I watch a new Gundam series, and I can't help but notice the business tactics Bandai is using. Overshadowing the storytelling by Studio Sunrise, Gundam was always more than just that. There's a reason why Gundam has remained relevant today, unlike other shows based on solely selling toys. Maybe the takeaway from this video is that when Bandai releases a brand new Gunpla from a new anime, it's better to appreciate the new kits for what they are, and not set your expectation too high about how they'll be portrayed in the anime. Fan theories can be fun, but they can also lead to disappointment if things don't play out as you imagine. Even though I have my concerns with the current state of Gundam, I'd be lying if I had said I haven't enjoyed watching the new series over the past 10 years. This franchise has become a part of me, and I don't think that connection will fade anytime soon. Okay... Once again, thank you so much for watching. I apologize for the jokes that came from my elusive thought this time. I also greatly appreciate the support of my last video, which has now become my most viewed on my channel. That really puts a smile on my face. Don't forget to like and subscribe. We are very close on reaching 1,000 subscribers. 
that's a wrap for me guys i hope you have a great day or night and i'll see you in the next video bye bye bye